Hello and welcome to a From Jihad to Jesus investigation. Let's begin with a test of your detective skills. In the following clip from the documentary Christian Persecution Coming to America, Yasser Eric, a German pastor, describes his alleged imprisonment in Sudan for converting to Christianity. His conversion itself is questionable, a point we'll cover later on. But for now, please pay close attention to the events as described. Handkerchief was brought to me by a group from the YMCA from Germany. They were visiting Khartoum. I took this with me. And I was glad that I took it with me. Because this handkerchief became everything for me during this time. I use it as a pillar. I use it as a bed on the ground because the floor was so hard. So this room was so small, I could not stand and I could not sit. I could not lay down and exchange. And this bad smell came very, very, very strong. So the next day when the guard was coming with his torch, bringing food to me, I would see like in the floor, so many dead bodies. I was not even able to read my Bible because I did not have any light a life. I was holding into this handkerchief every single day. And this handkerchief became like gave me hold, not because of the practical use of it, but because of the Bible verse that was written in it. And it was this Bible verse, the Lord is my light and my refuge. Now for some observations. First point. He said that his cell was so incredibly small that not only could he not lay down or sit, but he couldn't even stand. If you can't lay down sit or even stand, then what are you doing? Secondly, in this incredibly small floor space where he couldn't even stand or sit, there were actually undetected dead bodies on the floor, which he only noticed once a torch was brought. Third point, despite being jailed and tortured for converting to Christianity, they allowed him to bring his Bible to prison. And this was for reading in his cell, which was so pitch black that he couldn't notice the dead bodies on the floor. He received comfort from his handkerchief, which must have been extremely large, as it served not only as a pillow, but even as a bed. It's unclear though how he could use his handkerchief bed, since he said there wasn't enough space for him to lay down. And who were these courageous people risking their lives doing this covert missionary work to Muslims in 1990s Sudan? The YMCA. In fact, the YMCA has been doing humanitarian work in Sudan since the 80s. However, it's only allowed to do so under agreement with the government to not engage in any religious or political acts. So if this story is fabricated, as we have good reason to believe, then Yasser is jeopardizing the YMCA's humanitarian work by making such public claims. Who is Yasser Eric? He recently shot to fame with a video called From Jihad to Jesus, which received more than half a million views within two weeks of publishing. He's also a university lecturer, described as an outstanding expert on Islam. He's a published author. You can find his hardcover and audiobook on Amazon. He's a Lutheran pastor, a member of the main board of the German Evangelical Alliance, and a keynote speaker at Christian events such as ProChrist. I'll be going through each major event he describes in his life story, 
and indicate whether I believe they are authentic, questionable, or false beyond reasonable doubt. My sources are a critique of his book by a skeptical German Christian, a post on the Frontier Fellowship website, and his life story as described by himself in four videos published to YouTube over the course of seven months. The links to those sources are posted in the description of this video. Regarding my methodology, I'll be using an approach described in a 2015 BBC article. According to a study at the University of Wolverhampton, the most efficient way to detect a liar is actually to ignore body language and focus on four key conversational principles. The only available principle in this case being watch out for small verifiable details. At this point, I'd like to mention that, obviously, the following is not a professional investigation. The conclusions reached here are mine alone and are solely derived from the above stated sources. So we've already covered his prison story, which I'll classify as highly suspicious. If Yasser did convert at all, then it's certainly possible that he would have been imprisoned. However, his description of imprisonment is, beyond any reasonable doubt, absurd and incorrect. Next up, let's go straight to the core event, the story of Zechariah. That's the one where in high school, he and his gang beat up Zechariah and left him for dead in the forest, only for the two of them to miraculously reunite later in life. Time for detective skills test number two. I met him 25 years later and he was praying 25 years for me even though that was 25 years and on that moment in Cairo in the year of 2007 and one of the Sudanese pastors came to me it's an elderly man gray hair Alright, so the incident happened in high school, where they must have been between 12 and 17 years old. They then reunited 25 years later, he mentions this three times. Which means Zechariah, his classmate who sat next to him, must have been between 37 and 42 years old when they reunited. Going the other way around, in a 2019 response to his Christian critic, Yasser says he's almost 50 years old, so at most he's 49 in 2019. He says he met Zechariah in Cairo in 2007, which means 12 years before 2019. That would make him, at most, 37 years old at the time. 37-year-olds are not elderly, gray-haired men. To look at it another way, this is Yasser in 2021. Imagine what he looked like 14 years earlier, in 2007. I don't think anyone would describe him or Zechariah as elderly back then. I went through a lot of comments on the video, not all 4,000 of them, but I was surprised to only find one person who picked up on this. So congratulations to Mr. Techno Max. Point number two. Who covered Zechariah's mouth? Scream and begging for help. I put my hand in his mouth so that no noise will come out of it. Similar when you are slaughtering a sheep, you know, it's just shivering and the others were, were beating him. One of the guys was um, um, like, uh, putting his hand in his mouth, you know, and I was on the top of him and the other one, so we hit him so bad. Point number three, Zechariah's permanent blinding. And I saw the injuries in his face, in his face, the injuries in his face, where actually I damaged him. I saw his eye, which with which he no longer see 
because we enjoyed it. Out of the four videos in which he describes Zechariah's story in detail, this is the only one where he mentions anything about him being permanently blinded in one eye, which is strange considering his dramatic description of Zechariah's broken arms and legs 25 years later. Being permanently blinded is obviously a much bigger deal than just a broken arm which heals a few months later. It's inconceivable that he could have forgotten this detail in the other videos. Which year did the beating occur? 25 years before 2007 would put us in 1982, when Yasser would have been around 12 years old. This print screen from one of the clips, however, tells us that it happened in 1987, when he would have been around 16 or 17. The years don't match up. Now for the military-issued firearms. And we had our guns because we had the military training that time. And this, again, is the only video out of the four where he mentions anything about firearms. When you're describing an attempted murder scene, the presence of firearms is sort of an important detail. It raises other questions as well. If these five guys in his gang were determined to kill Zechariah that night, how could they fail to do so when they had guns? Also, if the event occurred in 1982, then it's hard to imagine 12 year olds being allowed access to military firearms. To put things in context, this is a picture of Yasser when he was 11 years old. Point six. Did he brag about the murders or did he try to cover it up? These are details from Yasser's book. As I can't speak German, I'll be relying on a critique made by another German Christian. That video is available on YouTube along with a full PDF transcript. For your reference, here is the relevant section. So on the one hand, Yasser in one clip says that he told his parents and people at school and they were proud of him. On the other hand, in his book, he says he wanted to cover things up. Nobody at school asked about Zechariah, but some people suspected his gang. This German Christian sent an email to Yasser and spent three and a half hours talking with him on the phone, trying to get some answers. He mentions that he doesn't want to expose Yasser, but he did say that his response was simply unbelievable and that it raised even more questions. Now for the seventh and final point, murder as jihad. This is a picture of a book of hadith or sayings of the Prophet wasallam, called Sahih Bukhari. It's very famous and it's unanimously agreed among Sunnis that this is the most reliable hadith book in existence. So what does it say about killing innocent non-Muslims living in Muslim lands? The Prophet said, Whoever killed a person having a treaty with the Muslims shall not smell the smell of paradise though its smell is perceived from a distance of 40 years. Now let's review the points regarding the story of Zechariah. For all of the above reasons, including the fact that we've never heard from or even seen a picture of the half-blinded Zechariah, I feel comfortable classifying this story as false beyond any reasonable doubt. Zechariah, to all appearances, is simply a product of pure fiction. Now let's move on to his so-called fanatic Muslim youth. In page 59 of his book, Yasser says that the, at the age of 16, he had a long, untrimmed beard. On pages 59 and 60, he says he had a mark of prostration as hard as a stone. For those unfamiliar with what the mark of prostration is, this is what it usually looks like. Interestingly, Yasser posted several pictures of himself in his book. This is Yasser at 16, 
with no long untrimmed beard or mark of prostration anywhere to be seen. This is Yasser at eleven, and sixteen or seventeen. And this is Yasser at eighteen. Nowhere do we see anything close to a long untrimmed beard or a mark of prostration, and it would be strange to have any of these two at such a young age. Note that there are no pictures of him wearing Islamic dress at the mosque or celebrating Eid. In fact, the closest proof we have of him being Muslim at all, it appears, is this picture of him riding a camel. So the German Christian also asked Yasser about this. Yasser's response was that the mark of prostration simply disappeared, which is an odd response considering Yasser also says in his book that he never missed a single prayer during those years. Regarding that long untrimmed beard, well Yasser says that it wasn't a Taliban beard. When asked what it was, he says that actually it was just a few centimeters long. When further questioned on why even that small beard didn't show up on the pictures, Yasser said, Well, you know what? I'm almost 50 years old. I can't remember. He says that in 2019. His book was written in 2017. So that's it. His long untrimmed beard actually was nothing. He exposed himself in his own book. Like the Arabic saying goes, the lie and its exposure often come from the same mouth. I think we can safely say that the beard and mark of prostration stories are lies. Yasser's Jihad in Southern Sudan I picked this up from a post on Frontier Fellowship from its associate director, Donald Marsden. Marsden met Yasser at a conference and reports that, during school holidays, he traveled with his friends to the south of Sudan to kill Christians for sport. This article dates back to May 2020, before all the other videos. However, this incredible part of Yasser's life somehow never gets retold. Perhaps Marsden made this story up. But let's see what Yasser has to say for himself. I did not go to southern Sudan as a jihadi to fight, but I went later on as a missionary, a person who speak about Jesus Christ. So when I was at the high school, before I went to university, before I went to the, before I went to, uh, before I went into the jihad in southern Sudan. He didn't go on jihad, but then he went on jihad after high school. It's confusing. If Yasser did say he went on jihad during that conference, then I'll classify this one under fabricated beyond any reasonable doubt. Yasser as a hafid of the Quran. Here's a few clips. When I was a child, my father brought me to a Quran school. You know, and they call me a Hafiz, you know, this is what we call uh, in, in, in Sudan. Mm -hmm. You know, I was so ignorant. I did not know that Muslims pray, and I did not know that Muslims believe in God. Uh, sorry, uh, Christians. A Christian, believe, Christians, yeah. Yeah, I did not know that Christians believe in God or pray. I mean, Muslims mm -hmm. do pray, of course. I was so ignorant. I did not know that Christians pray. And I did not know even that Christians believe in God. A hafiz is someone who memorized every single letter and even accent of the Qur'an by heart. For someone as fluent in Arabic as Yasser to claim that he didn't know Christians believe in God or prayed is factually impossible. Case in point. This is a verse from the top of the 10th page of the Qur'an. There are 604 pages in the Qur'an. So we literally haven't reached 2% yet. Indeed, those who believed and those who were Jews or Christians or Sabians, those who believed in Allah. In yellow and Arabic, Al-Nasara amana billahi. To give you an idea, 
This is a picture of the 10th page showing how far we've gone. I could give more examples, but I think you get the point. The German Christian says that Yasser also said in a video, I never got in my whole life the fact that God loves me. God and love in one sentence. I never heard that God loves me, that God has a plan for me. Again, it is literally impossible for any Arab speaker who memorized the Quran to make such a claim. You can see here, he posted the verse references specifically referring to Allah's love. Here is a copy of the book, An Explanation to the Beautiful and Perfect Names of Allah by Shaykh Al-Sa'di. One of the names of Allah found in the Quran is Al-Wudud, the loving. Again, I could go on, but I think you get the point. The German Christian confronted Yasser about this, and apparently he admitted his mistake, along with admitting to falsely claiming that Muslims believe Jews are descended from pigs. He agreed to publish an apology video in 2019, though I'm unaware if he's done so. Let's hear more about what this outstanding expert on Islam and university lecturer has to say. Islam does not save you. Even Muhammad, before he died, people asked him, where are you going to go? He said, I don't know. And he did not know. I'm not a scholar of Hadith, but to the best of my knowledge, this narration is completely false. Actually, the Prophet's last words before his death are, embarrassingly to Yasser, directly the opposite of what he claims. Here again from Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet wasallam says exactly where he'll be after his death with the highest companions. Fir Rafiq al A'la. Here again, O Allah with the highest companions. And one more time, O Allah with the highest companions. Can you imagine if a university lecturer claiming to be an outstanding expert on Christianity not only didn't know what Jesus' last words were according to the New Testament, but also said something completely the opposite? So Yasser as a memorizer of the Qur'an is a big no for me. And as if things can get any worse, we have Yasser's supposed revelations from God. Who spoke at the grave? The German Christian notes that in one of Yasser's videos, he says that a brother named Harun comforted him with words at his empty grave saying, I know someone else whose grave is empty. However, in another video, the words are changed to, My grave is empty too, thus showing us that it was Jesus, who Yasser believes is God, who spoke to him directly. Let's see that in English. I said to God, Where are you? I hear this voice. And this voice told me, You know that the grave where your name is written, you know that grave is empty. And guess what? My grave is also empty. Alright, now what does Yasser say about this in his autobiography? The German confronted Yasser about this omission as well, at which Yasser replied that the original script of the book was longer, but the editor had cut it down. The Christian then asked him if the incident was even in his original manuscript at all, to which Yasser replied that he could no longer remember. He would go back home and check. I don't know about you, but if I wrote a 251-page autobiography, I don't think I'd forget about that time when I received direct revelation from God. This isn't the only revelation that Yasser claims. On that day, God confronted me. He said to me, even before you start to think about me, I was thinking about you. For whatever reason, these two revelations aren't mentioned anywhere in any of his three earlier videos. Now when you think about it, Yasser is claiming to have received a direct message from God, which he's conveying to us. So technically, he is claiming to be a messenger of God, and he feels entitled to make other statements as well. 
baptized by two saints like really you know in china oh. you are you are saint for us you are mm. saint you know mm. you are the you are the prophets to the somali community you know if religion is a joke to you then fine go ahead and say whatever you wish but for me i don't believe yasser has the authority to declare anyone to be a prophet of god and needless to say I don't believe he's a messenger of God either. Moving on to the empty coffin, here's two clips for detective test number three. That they brought a coffin, they made a funeral, and they said, our son is dead. Family, they brought a coffin to the cemetery, and they said, our son is dead. The problem here is that Islamic tradition, especially in the conservative Arab world like Sudan, is to bury people in shrouds, not coffins. Here's an example of a burial in Sudan. Shrouded burials are basic knowledge that the majority of Muslims know, which then begs the question, did Yasser make a mistake not knowing about Islamic burials? And if so, is he even Muslim? Or is he simply fabricating stories to please his target audience? Let's take a look at two more videos. With lots of hatred in my heart, especially among, especially with, with lots of hatred in my heart, especially against those from Southern Sudan. That was for Muslim background believers. Now let's see what he has to say to One for Israel. And I especially used to hate the Jews. And when I started to read the scripture, nobody needed to convince me to love the Jewish people. The only way for Muslims to start to love the Jews is when they meet Yeshua. Not to go off topic, but when I think about loving the Jewish people, the first thing that comes to my mind is not German Lutherans. I'll classify this coffin story as questionable. It's not impossible, but it would be strange for a very fanatic Muslim family to do so. Even from an Islamic belief perspective, it's incorrect, as we believe that the doors of repentance are open to everyone until their death. Now for the Coptic priest at the hospital, the one that miraculously cured Yasser's cousin with his prayers. Time for detective test number four, and this one's a bit more of a challenge. This Coptic Christian said to me, God loves you. Jesus loves you. Yeah. You cannot come to God by your own work. The phrase, you cannot come to God by your own work, is a catchphrase used in Protestant theology, referring to a famous controversy called sola fide, between Catholics and Protestants. It makes sense for Yasser to say this, considering he's a Lutheran pastor. But it doesn't make sense for a Coptic priest, because their position is more aligned with the Catholic Church, believing that salvation requires both faith and good works. This again I'll classify as doubtful. Not impossible, but even ignoring the miraculous recovery, it does raise some doubts. Now on to the last part, Yasser's Sudanese origins and adoption. This is the final detective test. I won't be showing you any videos for this one, because it's something that's been staring at us in the face all along. Yasser's family name is Eric, which, of course, is not a typical Muslim family name. I'm not saying this is a smoking gun. I myself am Muslim, though I don't have a typical Muslim family name as I converted to Islam. But things do get interesting when we look deeper. According to forebears, the Eric surname is extremely rare in Sudan. In a population of 44 million, there are only 36 recorded occurrences. I acknowledge that this site is not very accurate, especially for countries like Sudan. But it is interesting to note that Eric is listed as a common family name in other African countries. All of which are Christian majority, except Nigeria and Chad, 
which still have huge Christian populations of 45 and 39 percent respectively. I'm assuming France here is reflecting its African migrant community. Here we see that in Kenya and Nigeria, almost 100% of people with the Eric family name are Christian. So how does Yasser explain this? Well, he doesn't in any of his videos. And I do find it sketchy that none of his four long English clips, not even a smaller one, mention his family name in the title. But then I found this interesting note in the Frontier Fellowship post. Disowned by his family, Yasser was adopted by a German family and given the surname of Eric. So then, who does Yasser claim to be before his adoption? Even though I come from a very big family, I was born and raised up in a very, very fanatic Muslim family. I went to a government elite school. Everybody to our home. And my family, they were in the government and they were involved in, in all of those hostile things against uh, Christians. To a very fanatic Muslim family. My grandfather was one of the main uh, people that really uh, grounded the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, like. Uh, and then, in the earliest of his four videos, we find posted under his group, the Muslim Background Believers, the answer. Yasser At-Turabi, At-Turabi, just like Hassan At-Turabi, the famous former Islamist leader in Sudan. This is a very astonishing claim. And it does make us wonder why Yasser never mentions this in any of his videos. For a relative of Hassan al-Turabi to have converted would be a huge deal for Christians. So are Yasser and Hassan al-Turabi related? Do they even look like they belong to the same ethnic group? Well, I asked four African friends, two Sudanese, a Somali, and a Nigerian. And all four of them told me, he doesn't even look Sudanese at all. His adoption by German parents appears even more suspicious when we consider that the Eric family name is also extremely uncommon in Germany. Only 73 cases out of 83 million people. Also, Yasser was in Sudan until at least 18 which means he would have been adopted as a fully grown man. And then there's this clip. You know, I mean, deep in me, I'm still a Sudanese. I'm still a proud yes. Sudanese, you know. Yes. You are a Somali, you know. Yes. You kept your yes. name, I kept my name. So He could be referring to his first name, of course. But once someone talks about proudly maintaining their heritage by not changing their name, you generally assume that they're talking about their family name. That being said, there's still the fact that Yasser speaks very good Arabic. It's possible that he's from Chad, the only Arabic-speaking country on the list, and bordering Sudan. Or it's possible that he's from somewhere else like Nigeria and learned Arabic during his studies in Egypt. Egypt is, after all, the most famous place to learn Arabic in the world. And it's also possible, of course, that he really is Sudanese and got adopted by Germans. To be honest, I don't know. And in fact, it's really hard to know anything about Yasser Eric at this point. For example, his university profile only mentions that he has a master's degree, but two of his videos, including one from his Muslim background believers group, claims that he's a doctor. So is Yasser Sudanese? Was he adopted? Was he ever even Muslim at all? I think that at the very least, his Sudanese origins and adoption story can be classified as extremely suspicious. That's it for our detailed review. But if we take a step back and look at the overall picture, 
Comparing the main events in his story, it sort of begins to look like a typical interrogation scene, where the suspect keeps changing the key facts over and over as time goes by. So with all of the points that we've covered, I believe it's safe to say that, from my perspective at least, beyond any reasonable doubt, Yasser Eric is a con artist. I think anyone who's seen his videos can agree that he's an amazing storyteller. And actually, I think he's an amazing actor as well, with a very disarming smile. But his attention to detail is honestly extremely poor, and that's where he gets caught. As the BBC article promised, the devil is in the details. This is not the first time that Yasser has been called out on his lies. In fact, the warning video came out in August 2019 before all of the other clips. Unfortunately, despite being confronted at the time, he chose to double down on his tale. Honestly, I hope, inshallah, that this will serve as a wake-up call for him. That he will be true to himself, repent, and turn his life towards the straight path. But I also have a question to all the evangelical groups associated with his story. How many of them were legitimately duped? And how many were in on the con? To those that were legitimately duped, I think it's in some way understandable. I mean, all of us, whether Christian, Muslim, or atheist, tend to let our guard down when we hear stories that agree with our preconceived worldview. I hope that in the future you'll be truthful in your quest for truth and seek knowledge about Islam directly from authentic and knowledgeable Muslim sources. After all, the Prophet ﷺ said that the cure for ignorance is to ask questions. To the organizations that were in on the con, I would firstly ask, aren't you ashamed of the hypocrisy? If there is lying in your life, you need to stop that. You know, this is not going to help you to grow. You cannot talk to people about Jesus can save them if you are struggling with those things. And also, isn't it embarrassing that you need to resort to fake convert stories when there are so many authentic stories out there about conversion to Islam? But most importantly, did your hatred of Islam blind you so much that you were willing to lie against God? And if so, what does this say about where your hate is coming from? Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.